Welcome everybody to episode 92 of Radicalized Truth Survives podcast. My name is Heidi Sigmund Kuda, and I just am so excited because High Fidelity and I are interviewing a very brilliant Ukrainian playwright today, Sasha Denisova. She has written two amazing plays, The Hague and My Mom and The Full Scale Invasion. We're going to bring you that interview and a shout out to Marina, our translator, who did a brilliant job. Check it out. When the war broke out, the Ukrainian government appealed to The Hague. At first, The Hague did not answer yes or no, so the Ukrainian government asked other countries for help. And so people from Europe and the United States started coming to Ukraine. When they saw what Putin had done, they were shocked, but the war was still going on. And a lot of bad things were still happening. And those bad things were collected by experts and put into special folders for the trial. And when the war was over, all the villains were arrested and the trial began. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here. This is a big deal to us because we are such fans of Sasha's work. And um, like I said, I've watched your plays and all kinds of languages that I don't speak. And I was able to see the different interpretations and it was just uh, incredible. And I find that your art is very, very brave. It's funny, it's beautiful, it's beautifully written, but there's a bravery to what you do in this time. And how, how important is art right now in fighting what we are going through and fighting against authoritarianism, fascism, how important is it to create art? Uh, yes, I got it and I switch in Ukrainian. Um, я маю такі дві речі, два спектаклі, як моя мама і повномасштабне вторгнення і Гага. So I have two plays on this topic. Uh, one of them is uh, The Hague and another one, uh, My Mom and Full Scale Invasion. And I believe those present weapons both in diplomacy and culture realm. Uh, I hope so, at least. And uh, nowadays we are all in that situation when art is a big weapon in fighting fascism in the world, while the world is getting tired of this war. Uh, so unfortunately the situation gets different. Uh, this war is too long already and it's going to be long. And the world is already tired. And uh, some people reached to me and asked uh, for the right to stage The Hague uh, in uh, Iceland. 
and they said that they were tired of the war there in Reykjavik in Iceland. So what about Ukraine? Ukraine is the most tired now. And uh, now when everybody gets tired of this war and we still need to talk about this, I think that this uh, weapon as art should be in such a genre as comedy, tragic comedy, to make people interested and not to be too tired of the topic of the war. So that's how I present my plays. That was amazing. And Hi-Fi and I will alternate asking questions. I'm going to ask one more, then Hi-Fi, you'll ask the next one. Um, thank you so much for that, both of you. That's incredible. Uh, I just find it to be so vitally important. Um, let's start with The Hague, because I cannot wait to talk about your your mother and the full-scale invasion. Like, your, I, I just, I love, I love your mom. I feel like I know her. Um, what made you decide to tell uh, the story of The Hague through the eyes of a Ukrainian orphan? Because that obviously was a brilliant uh, strategy in relaying the important content. But what made you make that decision? Все почалося от початку війни, тому що худрук польського театру в Познані це найстаріший театр в Польщі. Uh, the director of Polish theater in Poznan, which is the oldest theater, asked me to stage a play about Putin. And at that moment I said that I have only one word for Putin, and it's Hague. That's how my play was born. And uh, at first I staged it myself in Poland. Then um, I brought my play to the USA, to Boston. Uh, I staged the play in Harlequin Theatre. Uh, and after that, uh, we traveled to Bulgaria and uh, with the famous uh, uh, play director, um, Halin Stoyev. We staged it in Sofia, in Bulgaria, and it, it was a very important event because whole government was present there. And at that time it was rather risky because they were probably opposed to uh, this idea of Putin being in Hague. Uh, but this play was very important, very impactful, because everybody uh, understood what we wanted to say. And now Bulgaria is delivering a lot of aid to Ukraine, including weapons and so on and so forth. Uh, so this, place, uh, this play was really impactful. That's so beautiful. I have so many questions, but hi fi I don't want to hog the room. So you go next, please. Uh, did. Oh. did you want to add something, Sasha? Uh, yes, maybe about the the. I um uh, I I want to continue on this topic about uh, the Hague in um in Bulgaria, if I can. Please. Please. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, when we staged uh, The Hague in Sofia in Bulgaria, whole government was present, including pro-Putin party, including pro-Putin politicians and members of embassy, and uh, they were watching the play, and at the moment when Putin appeared on stage, and this role is always played by a woman, uh, brilliantly played by a woman, uh, with this makeup making her look like Putin and uh, it was so fun and people looked at it and they started snorting as if it was uh, a seance of exorcism. They couldn't believe that this could be shown on a stage and uh, that's how it went in that theater, very old theater for 750 plays in a room and with all those pro-Putin politicians looking at the truth. That's what I was saying about the courage involved in this. Here, it's like Sasha, you are so brave, and I'm I, I view you as so heroic because there's there's moments in time, just like in the 30s and the 40s, where artists made big bold statements, and it was dangerous to do so, but it's so necessary. And I'm going to guess that even some of those pro-Putin people in the room internally were probably applauding because they know what you're reporting is the truth and that your art expresses the truth. 
um, high fidelity. Do you want to ask a question? I do. Uh, in, in The Hague, you, as you just said, you emasculate Putin by portraying him as a woman. You emasculate Katarov by showing his cowardness and his his fake uh, Instagram identity. You absolutely capture the insanity of Petrushev and his rant. Um, what helped you tear back the lies and the myths that these men surround themselves with? Okay. Following documentary method in playwright, uh, I had to study all the real quotes by those people and I read their real words. I also consulted with Kremlin insiders and with uh, lawyers, uh, human rights lawyers, uh, and those people told me, um, they gave me information about how those people from Kremlin really speak. How, uh, what language they really use, and uh, how the process of Hague would look like. It would look like Nuremberg process, probably. Uh, it would be organized in that way. So it gave me an idea to to show it on stage and to put it on stage. And uh, as for the way how those people speak, they are really insane people. They are really madmen because they do talk about those geese and insects and whatever else which can be used in combat combat trained geese and combat trained insects so they really are mad they're talking about shambhala about looking for eternal life and things like that and uh, that's not exaggeration that they are real quotes how they speak and i showed that they are mad people because truly they are I did not come here to make excuses. I came here to accuse. We are on trial for the war in Ukraine. But we were not at war with Ukraine. We were at war with a country that has long wanted our defeat. The United States of America, immediately after defeating Germany, the USA has begun to devise an operation to attack the USSR. You remember Churchill's speech? Huh? 1946. And what was NATO created for? Hmm? <laughs> the Americans. <laughs> The Americans, they took our victory for themselves. Even though we lost 25 million and they lost mere thousands, 
<laughs> and they made Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> and, a, and a Munich deal and Minsk agreements. Why didn't they stop Hitler when he invaded Poland? Hmm? Why didn't they stop Putin when he invaded Ukraine and when he, he took the Crimea? Why did they wait? They hesitated. <laughs> they were waiting for Russia's military power to be depleted. That's why. Oh, oh, how they rejoiced in the collapse of the Union and how much they invested in the colored revolutions. They were afraid of us. And now they rejoice in our defeat. You think, you think you live in a protected, civilized world? Huh? But I know more. I so appreciate how um, the character uh, that was to portray the head of RT, um, Simonian, if I say that right, I love how she walked around with the hypnotic watch as she was going to hypnotize people with her lies. That was an amazing device. And I love how at the end, nobody took responsibility for anything. It wasn't me. I didn't know. I was doing my job. Let's blame the Putin. I thought that was like so profoundly important because it echoed what we saw in Germany, but it also was an admission that they knew what they were doing the whole time. And the character uh, portraying the head of RT says that she had a, a gun in her back to do this work. But I believe that line was just her covering and that they all very cynically know what they're doing know that they're lying and they absolutely in reality in my opinion these propagandists do need to be at the hague they are war criminals like we saw in nazi germany and do you agree with that that the ultimate place where these people need to end up is acts absolutely in a war tribunal uh, I do believe that propagandists de deserve a place on such uh, a court like in Hague. I do believe they deserve a special bench for convicts there, and I think they should be convicted. Uh, as well as it happened in Congo and Rwanda when there was massacre and propagandists through radio uh, they uh, called for massacre, they called for genocide, and those people were convicted. So I think people who do the same in Russia also deserve uh, the same destiny. And uh, now we have this problem. There are different terms. There is the term battle on ground, crimes made on ground, but there's also this um, aggression, military aggression, uh, which is given by orders. And Putin and uh, all his band are just given orders, but they are not doing crimes on ground. But it's important to uh, acknowledge that they are also guilty by those orders. They are not here on the ground, but they give orders, and this is a crime against humanity. And since Nuremberg, we don't have mechanism to stop it. Uh, since uh, World War II, uh, there were a lot of wars, and nowadays 28 wars are in process, and the Ukrainian war also in process, and we have this example of Iraq. 
and um, we don't have mechanisms to stop wars we don't have mechanisms to stop that military aggression and after the uh, future process in hague uh, I believe that this mechanism will start to exist when uh, countries, empires like Russian Empire, who start wars, they would be stripped of that possibility. They wouldn't have any chance to start a war. And I try to show this utopic future picture when uh, starting the war is impossible when humanity would prohibit that to happen i just i'm marveling at the beautiful job marina is doing relaying your incredible insights hi fidelity do you have a question because i can keep going as you know how would you compare the situation in which the world just now is waking up to the fact that Wu that Putin is a war criminal, even though he invaded Crimea in 2014, uh, he's invaded Georgia, Chechnya. Um, the man has assassinated his own political rivals. Um, he is a dictator. He is an authoritarian. He is a mob boss. Here in America, we don't even have the mob boss. We have his mob lieutenant, Trump. And some of America still hasn't awakened yeah. to the fact that Trump is a mob lieutenant for Putin. What would you say to those Americans who don't know? Тут є такий феномен, тому що всі ця війна. So the war is evolving in front of the whole world. Everybody is watching how this war is how this war is going on, and nobody is doing anything. Uh, Putin started in Russia, in, in Georgia, in Chechnya, and he annexed Crimea in 2014, and he started hybrid war, and he also annexed uh, part of Donbass, Luhansk Oblast, Donetsk Oblast, and uh, Europe and the United States were looking, they were watching the process, but they were doing nothing. Moreover, they were talking to Putin, they were having deals, uh, he was part of economy, he was part of negotiations, and people would uh, look up to him. They would listen to him, to his opinion, and to count on his opinion. So it looks like the world swallowed everything that Putin did. He tried it once, he tried it twice, and he saw no response to his actions. So in my opinion, uh, Europe and the United States uh, helped Putin grow up. They helped nourish him and educate him. And now he feels this power. Wow, great response and so incredibly true. Um, I have two more things that I'm interested in in The Hague, and then I want to move on and save a few minutes to talk about my mom and the full-scale invasion. Um, one thing I want to bring up is that I thought the way that you handled the Russian soldier was brilliant and so much more nuanced than anybody uh, could imagine. And what I mean by that is that you made it clear that the soldier had nothing and was poor and was jealous of how the Ukrainians were living. And I thought that was really, really important because most of the people who end up having to go in these wars, you mentioned 28 wars, are poor. They're the people who couldn't get out, whose families couldn't get out. Look at Trump. He had six deferments to not go into you know, the war in Vietnam. So the privileged avoid this while they send people. And I just want you to sort of give our 
viewers a little bit of a, refle a reflection on how you shaped the character of the Russian soldier, because I was very, very moved by your approach to that. Так, російського солдата взагалі то сиграв такий американський актор Геральд Сенс. The interesting, uh, the interesting thing about the actor who played the Russian soldier is that that's a famous American actor, um, Harrod Sands, and um, he looks like a real Anglo-Saxon, which is uh, contrary to his role. Uh, and on that contrast uh, is the metaphor. He starts from denying everything. He starts from saying that he's not guilty and he just followed orders, and he's just a poor boy who's, who's not guilty of anything. But then the story unfolds, and the uh, thread follows, and we know that all the crimes that happened were crimes on his hands, and he was guilty of massacre that happened in Bucha. He killed people. Uh, he was there. And um, uh, this story repeats itself uh, as it was in the Second World War, and there were other plays, like uh, the famous play uh, Interrogation by uh, Peter Weiss, uh, which is a play about Svensson. Uh, and the world saw the story through this play. And nowadays, more and more uh, works of art appear that show this truth, like film uh, by Mstislav Chernov, 20 Days in Mariupol, which received Oscar this year. And I watched it several times uh, while I was working on my novel uh, i'm uh, now i'm working on my novel which is following the play hague and uh, while doing my work on this novel i watched a film of by Mstislav chernov 20 days in mariupol and that's insane it's beyond understanding mariupol was getting killed in front of all the world People were looking and people were doing nothing. The whole city was destroyed. And it's so impressive and so impactful that people should know about that. Something should be done about that. And I believe that uh, the fact that such films and such plays do exist and they continue to happen and they receive Oscars is very important to our society. Wow, that's so powerful. Um, Hi-Fi, should I keep going or do you have a question? I have about three more questions before we... Okay, I'll, I'll do one and then you do yours. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the world seems to have the attention span of a child. They watched for a few years while Russia committed crimes in Ukraine. And as soon as October 7, Hamas and Israel conflict started, it feels like everyone forgot about Ukraine. How do you address the fact that the attention span of the Western world is basically that of a baby with a shiny object when the crimes continue. And and also to add to that, what do we do about that? I mean, obviously, we are trying to put the attention back on Ukraine with everything we do on this show, but what do we do about that? So great question. Я була місяць в Філадельфії, колись була така друга частина. At that time, I spent a month in Philadelphia with the second part of the play, uh, Mama and Whole Scale Invasion. And I read the news about that, and it all, uh, all the news of Ukraine were after coma, with, combined with the news from Israel. 
Uh, and at that time, it was pretty obvious that uh, people's attention was scattered. Uh, Ukraine wasn't on the first place anymore. And after that, some kind of loss of attention happened, and it was just abrupt loss of attention. People were not talking about Ukraine all of a sudden. And uh, that influences the situation on the front line and the situation in peaceful cities in Ukraine. Now, when I returned back from Kyiv, I spent some time there, uh, I can say that people are talking about a lack of air defense systems and shells and weapons on front. And people are worried about their lives even in Kyiv which is the capital. And I can say that while being in Kyiv, I could walk uh, safely in the center of Kyiv. I don't feel danger when I'm in the center of Kyiv, but when I go to the part of the Kyiv where my mom lives, it's more dangerous there because everything is burning, exploding, something is falling from the sky all the time. And I'm worried about my mom, of course, and it gets me nervous very much. So that's not a normal situation. And uh, people on the front, they rely on Western aid uh, in weapons, but now they have lack of weapons and this aid, uh, it's not stopped, but it's dripping like drop by drop. Uh, it's not enough. Uh, and people's lives depend on that. Beautiful response. Thank you so much for that. And this is the perfect place to spend a few minutes talking about my mom and the full scale invasion play. Um, there's a great quote from you. I think it was in The Guardian where you talked about how Putin must be mocked mercilessly, frequently. And my mom and the full scale invasion tells an incredible story about this strong mom of yours born into World War II, born into war, and not wanting to leave her home. But also um, throughout it, when we see Putin, he he's looks like an alien-headed little, you know, creepy rat sneaking around. And then I also love how with the drone you see Putin's face. And through through telling the story, of this incredibly strong woman, you also manage to uh, tell the story of this really, you know, what what I believe is just a malignant creep of a human being as Putin. And I don't know if that's even a question that can be answered, but I love, I guess there's a duality that I love there, the mocking of Putin and this incredibly heroic, strong mother. No, так. Взагалі, то треба подякувати за режисуру Юрі Юрі Урнову. I'm grateful to people who helped stage this play in the USA. It's Yuri Ornov and uh, Misha Kachman. Uh, and um, uh, I should say that my mom also took place, uh, took part in organizing the staging process. She approved all the actors. She approved the actor who played her role, approved the dress and everything. And uh, when she watched the play, she called to uh, called up to her husband Ihor and said, Ihor, look who's playing you. So she was involved in the process and uh, she, she was deeply involved in it. And she approved almost everything, that jar of pickles and everything that appeared on the stage, it should look authentic. And now uh, my mom has this picture that I cut from American Theatre magazine, 
hanging above her on the wall and um, uh, those uh, words that were written about the play in Wilma Theatre and the play the stage in the USA and it's phantasmagoric that the play is there in the US and my mom is here in Kyiv and now she became like this weapon or instrument in this cultural war and probably if the war had ended that would be a good idea to travel everywhere with my mom and to talk about this to everyone and that should be a very interesting and fun process but the war is not ended and my mom is still there living this war we don't know in what point of this war we are now uh, it hasn't ended it has to proceed and we don't know what follows and my mom is uh, my mom is now like a character uh, mom courage from uh, Bertolt Brecht uh, she she doesn't know the future and uh, it's it's fun but it makes me cry too I can't say that uh, this is a healthy situation, that my mom is still in the situation of full-scale invasion. For me to say everything I haven't said. Sasha! Can't you see I'm busy? I imagine my mother delivering an address to the nation. Dear Ukrainians, the situation is grave on all fronts. The enemy strives to catch Kiev, our motherland's heart. I am in constant contact with the heads of allied nations. Today, I want to address you, my compatriots, everyone who can put up resistance should enlist in territorial defense units. They have issued weapons to Igor and I. In regards to provisions, Ukrainians, we have provisions. I just found some buckwheat on the balcony, sorted through it, it's fine. <laughs> buckwheat can last 10 years if need be. Oh. You grind down carrots, beets, and peppers with salt, put it in the fridge. Do you know the password? Palinitsa, that is correct. You buy a loaf of bread, put it in the freezer, and it's good for days. If power gets cut off, keep butter submerged in cold water, like my grandma did during the war. Replace the water the next day, nothing will happen to the butter. <laughs> Meat goes on the balcony. Borscht is to be boiled and boiled again and boiled again. Got bugs, pick them out. Potatoes are growing sprouts, cut them off. The enemy's success or failure rests on our resourcefulness. One woman in the Golosayevsky district shot down a drone with a jar of pickles. Stay the course. Glory to Ukraine. Glory to the heroes. Plug your windows with soft foam. Sleep by load-bearing walls. I can't go down to the bomb shelters. Not with feet like mine, but you should go. Do not ignore air raid signals. Go and sleep there! Well, I'm very glad that you wrote the play for many reasons, but one of them is that we don't cherish women enough. We don't write enough art about older women and their values and their how valuable they are and their wisdom and all of that. So I am so grateful. I helped I help look after my mother who's 86 and she grew up during war. She grew up in, you know, essentially Yugoslavia, then Germany, and she's so strong. And so to to see the love that you portrayed, you know, um your mother with for me was just incredibly moving. And of course, throwing a jar of pickles at a drone is nothing short of brilliant. Um, I have one more question for this round. Hi, Pfizer, anything else on your mind? I would just like to know, when are we going to see a film version 
of Putin at the Hague? Коли ми побачимо фільм, actually, власне кажучи, я для того і Actually, that's the person, uh, the purpose of my writing. I write my novel about Hague for more people to know about that and probably later to have a film about that, maybe even on Netflix with some fancy actors that the world could uh, approve and could see. And uh, I don't know if Putin would see it or not. Uh, maybe we shouldn't talk about that right now. But more and more people should see that film and should read the play and the novel. And uh, for now, I have a kind of obsession by the idea of Hague, uh, and uh, I'm writing uh, more and more about this. And actually, now, now I'm working on another project, Hague 2, uh, which shows Putin, just him, and two inspectors who are interrogating him in Hague. Uh, that's uh, Again, a trial, but with Putin himself, just just only this character. And um, maybe I would like Putin to read and to watch the film about him and to react like Hitler reacted on Charlie Chaplin, to stomp his feet, to cry out and to be mad about the uh, process of art uh, making making him small. But I doubt that. I think Putin wouldn't watch it because he is there, uh, dug down deep in his bunker and he's somewhere. He's not interested. He's not watching anything. But still, I, I'm not writing for Putin. Who's, who's Putin? I don't care. But I care for more and more people to watch it. And maybe such a film could be impactful in terms of minds of Russian people. They are living there like under a glass dome. They have their lives. They don't know. Uh, they don't want to think about anything else. And uh, but they should. And I think the process should be similar to the process with uh, Germans after the Second World War. They had to face the truth, and they were brought to Osvensum, and they sh they were shown all the atrocities that were done by their army, by uh, their forces. And uh, Russians now try to normalize the situation they are living in, and that's not right. They should face it. And maybe if they had a chance to watch a film with fancy American actors who, who they trust, or to watch a nice film on Netflix, or somehow maybe uh, some black market could bring this film to Russia for them to watch it and to understand uh, the truth. I think that would be a good influence and that could really do the job. And uh, still now when I'm writing on my uh, works, my plays and my novels, I'm not writing a documentary book. Uh, I'm an artist and of course I look at it from the point of view of art, but still when I studied my main specialty was documentary and a documentary method prevails in my work. So of course uh, all those facts about Bucha, Mariupol and other atrocities made in Ukraine, done in Ukraine, uh, that would be included in my work and I will talk about it in my uh, artistic work, but still uh, those documentary bits will appear there from the point of view of art. Absolutely. there. Yes, I can see the documentary thread, but the art and the dancing and just the music style and how literate you are, your literary references are so incredible. My last question for you for this portion of our interview is, I only learned about the executed Renaissance last year, the purge under Stalin of Ukrainian playwrights and reporters and poets, journalists. And that was the first time that I ever, as a writer my entire life and a reporter my entire life, ever really fully realized just how powerful writers are and just how dangerous writers are to uh, those who create lies and unreality, the dictators out there. And how important is it that you are able to get your art out in this moment? Why is it so important that people need to see it 
and and hear your voice. I believe it's important. When I started in university back in the 90s, uh, the executed Renaissance was very important to us. And all the artists, for example, who uh, we were like icons to us. And uh, now I think that the past uh, is a zone of reflection for our society. People are thinking about that past and trying to understand it and incorporate it. Uh, and now I saw in Kyiv a lot of bookshops are opening. There's a huge demand in the society to know more, to read about art and to get acquainted with it. Uh, and anytime you enter any bookshop, you'll see a huge crowd of people there. Uh, people would be in lines for buying books or for attending some events. And uh, my friends who work in Philharmonic, they say that uh, it's booked all the time. At day and at night, there are concerts and people are attending those concerts. They want to listen to music, they want to read literature, um, they want to go and see plays in theater by Franco and Lesia Ukrainka, famous theaters in Kyiv. Uh, there are no tickets. It's very difficult to buy tickets because people are so obsessed in going there and seeing that. And that's wonderful that at times of war, at times of troubles, people don't forget to face uh, the art and uh, to, to get acquainted with it and to enjoy it. And um, uh, now we have these two vectors for Ukrainian art and for consuming of Ukrainian art. The first one is um, in Ukraine, it's understanding ourselves, understanding our identity through our past. And executed renaissance is a part of this process, of course. But in Europe, we have to present ourselves in the best way we can. We need to show that we are part of a big European artistic family. We need to show that the quality of our art is superb. And uh, that's two ways uh, which identify uh, the process of making art nowadays. And um, of course, uh, we also have this idea of uh, post-colonial reflections, uh, because Russia as empire never went anywhere, it's still there. And uh, we as a country which is surrounded by enemies, uh, we need to survive and we need to find power somewhere and art and understanding our past and our present through art is really important and there is a big demand in society of course so that's how it works thank you both so much for being here that was so incredibly beautiful and now i'd like to hear from sasha's mother <laughs>